Hello Booktube, and welcome to the first meeting of our philanthropic society dedicated to consorting with lonely trollops. <laughs> this is, we are going to read the standalone novels of Anthony Trollope, some of them, in 2020, after having spent a lot of time with uh, his Palliser books, which he wrote two long series of novels that, that sort of buoy each other up, even though they're, they're not, strictly speaking, sequels. Uh, and we're going to dispense with that world, that interconnected world, for the rest of 2020, and just consort with lonely trollops, the ones that don't have any company of books in series. Uh, and we're starting with Trollope's 1875 novel, The Way We Live Now, the longest book that he wrote. Uh, and in the course of the four years that I've been on Booktube, we have read a lot of Trollope together. It's been a great deal of fun. Uh, and no matter what the plots of those books have been, no matter how far they have ranged, uh, they haven't ranged very far, Trollope knew what he was about, uh, there's been a quality. A lot of you have noticed it, a lot of you said it's what is principally addictive to you about Trollope. That is certainly true of people who have read him for a century before you were born. The quality in Trollope that tends to bring people coming back is his warmth. These books are told in a third-person omniscient character and uh, by a narrator who is uh, gentle and warm. The, the, the narrator knows everything about the characters, including very much their shortcomings. Uh, but the books are told with a kind of uh, gentle smile. A small amount of reproof, but a gentle smile. Uh, and that makes the atmosphere of these books always a very difficult quality to pin down. Uh, that makes the atmosphere of these books utterly winning, <laughs> just utterly like like a warm a woolly sweater that you can just pull close around you. That's why people keep coming back to Trollope. That's a big reason, I believe. Um, and in this book, <laughs> in this book, that quality is largely absent. Uh, Trollope in the, in the early 1870s had been out of London. He had been in Australia and uh, in the colonies. <laughs> he had been, he'd been traveling and uh, he'd been writing the whole time, of course. He'd kept up with that and with his family and all. But he had been out of the hurly-burly of London. And it, then he came back. <laughs> he came back in the early 1870s. And like most times, it, I'm sure it's happened to you, if you spend an extended amount of time away from your home, when you come back, you see it, at least briefly, with different eyes it seems almost like another destination. Certainly it's easier for you to see its faults if you've been away for a significant amount of time. Keep in mind how long travel took in Trollope's day. Uh, and that happened with Trollope. Someone who, who was, who had had 30-something novels to his credit, he had been a literary name, a force in the literary world for well over a decade, uh, extremely well paid, well known, name recognition. Uh, He'd been a part of that world and a part of the country squire world <laughs> and, and Waltham Cross. And he, he uh, loved it. But when he came back, he saw, that it, what, he saw it in a different light. And because he, <laughs> because he was, I, in my opinion, because he was reluctant to admit that he was not quite so much the flavor of the month anymore, that, that the literary world was perhaps moving on from him, and that maybe it was a thing that some readers in bookstores would say, that their parents or even their grandparents might want a new Trollope novel, but not them. That is Wormwood to an author who I believe always was fairly young at heart as Trollope. And it's possible that he didn't want to see that, that he didn't want to look at that clearly. So instead, he looked extra clearly at London and declared that it had changed. <laughs> All he saw were blemishes everywhere he looked. A cheapness, a chintziness, a, a striving and, and grubbing for power and for money. Uh, disdain of traditions, all the traditions that, that, that he loved and that he loved to celebrate in his books. Uh, and being Trollope, of course, he never had, never had a single thought or sentiment that he didn't write somehow, that he didn't capture somehow in writing. He just, he became, over the course of those 30-something novels, he became a living conduit. Inspiration straight to page. Uh, and spared nothing, saved nothing, discarded no almost nothing. Uh, almost, and, and he decided to write and wrote the beginning of The Way We Live Now, the book that we now know as The Way We Live Now, uh, in a fury. And in a very different kind of, of fury than any of the slightly more genial and broader-based furies that had maybe animated some of his other books. You can feel it right away in this book that that is gone. Now, uh, 
I uh, believe that, that Trollope found that to be a bit of a strain to maintain. It wasn't his natural voice, I think, in fiction. I think that it exercised a lot of demons at first for him to just charge into this thing and, in a Swiftian manner, find damning faults everywhere so that there is no weather vane, there is no, there is no thing, no person uh, in the early parts of the, of the novel uh, that you can say, well, here is the unbesmirched and this is the yardstick by which you can measure all the besmirchments. There isn't anything like that in this novel, the closest that we come are the, the, the insipid couple at the, at the center of the book, but they're not all that pure. <laughs> so, but uh, Trollope had to break off with the work of, of, he was charging ahead with this book, significant amounts of pages per day, and he had to break off in order to write a pre-promised uh, and much lighter, much, much shorter novel. And he, I believe that when he did that, he wrote that novel and delivered it, uh, I believe that when he did that, uh, something of the original fury of his animus in this book broke. And I think you can tell that in the book. Not in the, we're reading 20 chapters a week, 20 chapters every Sunday for the month of March, which is a pretty painless way to get an enormous book like this done. I expect all of you to dash off a check to Book Aid International. Remember, Alan Morton's Chunksters for Charity Challenge is running all throughout the year. And <laughs> no matter what edition you're using, the way we live now counts as a chunkster. Uh, I believe that later on, the first 20 chapters, are main, we're mainly setting up our story. So I don't think you're going to see it there. The first 20 chapters of this book are angry. They are not genial Uncle Trollope at all. Uh, later on, I believe we'll, we'll be able to sort of lay on the hands and diagnose where that break happens. Where it starts to happen. Where this starts to settle into a little bit more of a normal Trollope novel. I don't think it ever gets there. Uh, I don't think it ever it ever quite becomes a normal Trollope novel, but it comes close, closer, later on. But not in the 20 chapters that we're reading today. The 20 chapters that we're reading today introduce us to a mind-boggling amount of plots and subplots. <laughs> this, is a, this is a big, full novel. Now, the one that gets remembered most, the one that stuck out in Trollope's day and that we remember now, is uh, Monsieur Melmotte, <laughs> who is a, a, this uh, shaggy, eyebrowed, slightly ursine, menacing foreign financier who is, the, when the novel opens, the absolute toast of London. He's bought an expensive mansion. He's laying, uh, re reported to be as, as rich as Croesus. He's having a gigantic party at which the emperor, the emperor of China, I think it is, is coming to. The royals go to his, uh, to his balls. The dukes and duchesses that we know so well from Trollope's world are fawning all over this guy, even though secretly, uh, we meet a couple of them in these early chapters secretly. Some of them dislike the man's familiarity and would like to kick him <laughs> because he doesn't show due deference. Uh, and uh, Monsieur Melmont has a daughter, <laughs> whose name is Marie. She is not our unsullied uh, yardstick by which you measure all the corruption around here. She is not as bad as her father. He is, we are given to believe right away, Trollope doesn't, doesn't exactly hide this. <laughs> We're given to believe right away that Melmot is a horrible swindler and a, and a horrible creature of a person with no human sympathies whatsoever. And Marie Melmot is not that much better. Trollope's, uh, Melmot's wife uh, is certainly no paragon. She is uh, crude and an ignoramus. And Marie Melmot is the, uh, the apple of London's fast society because it's it's just assumed by everyone that she will be the greatest heiress of all time because her father is so incredibly rich. <laughs> he, the father, is at the moment, Melmot, in the, at the beginning of this book, is busy pumping up uh, a scheme for a railroad that runs from Utah to Mexico. An obvious, uh, Trollope being rather obvious uh, in making it a pure bunkum scheme. And the, the, the people that, that Melmot brings in on the board or in as investments and selling and whatnot and his American partner, Mr. Fisker, uh, they know that it's a swindle. They, none of, there are no true believers anywhere. Even the, the, the alleged virtuous character in the mix, Paul Montague, knows perfectly well that his job is first and foremost from beginning to end selling shares in that railroad. It's not anything to do with the railroad itself. It's just making money off the speculation. Uh, and that is just that is just one of the plots that we have. We are also introduced to right away to uh, Lady Carberry, who is 
her 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 horrible wretched husband has has died and he's left her with almost no money and she needs to make her way and has decided that she will make a literary career for herself she has worked on a book called criminal queens the more you know about the Victorian era, the specific Victorian era in which Trollope is writing this book, the more you will see these elbows land. <laughs> Trollope had a very particular bestseller in mind when, when he came up with, with uh, Lady Carberry's literary project. But Lady, Lady Carberry also has children. Uh, she has a daughter, Henrietta, uh, who is the insipid young woman that I was talking about. She, uh, and she has a son, Sir Felix, is the, is the, uh, the heir to the baronetcy. Uh, that her husband had. And Sir Felix is a classic Trollope young man. He is beautiful and stupid and totally self-absorbed. Totally. He's, he's incapable even of remorse on the subject. You can't even get him that far. He is totally concerned with money and with his own pleasure. He could not care any less about his sister or his mother. Barely thinks about them at all except to siphon funds out of his mother when he can. Um, and and Felix is part of a, a young set of of uh, drums club aristocrats that Trollope does so well. He does them so well in other novels, but here, here the gloves are off, and it feels different. There's a there's a, a gentleman's wastrel club called the Bear Garden, where all these these losers hang out, and they are lords or sons of lords. They have various degrees of money or debt. Uh, most of them are thorough, intoxicated inebriates, uh, and that is Sir Felix's world. Uh, but he knows on an animal level that he needs to marry money. And he is well inside the guard and the affections of Marie Melmot. He is, he is the front runner for her affections. <laughs> and naturally, uh, Sir Felix's mother, Lady Carberry, would very much like him to bear down, stop sleeping until three, <laughs> stop sleeping it off until three, bear down and actually get the young woman to commit to marry you. Because that would solve everything. It would mean she wouldn't have to work her fingers to the bone writing her books. <laughs> we're, we're, we're given several, I will go on, we're given several ideas of how that writing happens. <laughs> uh, and uh, there are love affairs that extrapolate out from there. Uh, the head of the Carberry family, Sir Roger, lives in the country. He's an old-fashioned squire. He, he's uh, disdainful of London. In, in some ways, he could be viewed as Trollope's stand-in, at least for the beginning part of this novel. And he would like to marry his cousin, Henrietta. But her affections are turned elsewhere towards the aforementioned Paul Montague, uh, who doesn't have a shilling to his name, but still would like. <laughs> and you see what I mean. This is, we get the, the normal Trollope templates here of, of uh, love pairings that seem at first not to work. Trollope is going to throw, especially in the path of Paul and Hedda, he's going to throw everything but the kitchen sink in the path of their true love running smooth. Uh, and it, I, don't think it, I don't think it takes much uh, perception on the part of a reader in these first 20 chapters to think that R Sir Roger's chances are probably very slim <laughs> for, for any kind of happiness with, with the, the beautiful young woman who is at the heart of the book. Uh, but the whole time that this is happening, the whole time that people are, are pumping up a, a New World Railroad that is obviously a, a, just a farrago, a scheme, the whole time that we are, that we are reading about the, the wretched excess of Mr. Melmot and his parties and the, the familiarities that he takes with the landed aristocracy, the whole time that we're reading about the horrible ways that the landed aristocracy are themselves, they, the, 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 we meet a, one of of Sir Felix's young noble friends, we're going to have a lot to say about him in later discussions of this book, can't stand his father, his father can't stand him, their money is separately entailed, they're at each other's throats except they need each other, and so on and so forth. You look everywhere in these first 20 chapters for a gleam of the kind of warmly considered general humanity that is that has been such a staple in our Trollope reading, and it's not there. You can look in vain for it. Uh, and it wasn't quite the first, it, it wasn't just the first 20 chapters of this that came out, uh, but this book was published serially before it became a novel. So readers and critics were able to get a whack at it long before it became uh, a novel in 1875. Uh, and if Trollope had had a bit of anger going in, that maybe his his antenna were his 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 senses were telling him his senses are usually particularly acute 
were telling him that maybe he wasn't quite the thing anymore, that maybe he was almost an anachronism, that would certainly inform a lot of the ways that he, that he uh, describes what, what few things we can see in this book he approves of. It's an approval of anachronism. But if we get the feeling uh, that Trollope might, that some of his anger at this book, my contention is that some of the anger that was funneled into at least the beginning half of this book was born of the fact that Trollope was understanding on a level that maybe he didn't want to admit that he wasn't quite the same Trollope that he had been 20 years before, 10 years before, 20 novels before. <laughs> that, that maybe something had shifted, if you can see what I mean, that maybe his day had passed or was beginning to pass. Uh, the publishing world was changing. Uh, the reading tastes of lending libraries and the public were changing. And maybe Trollope wasn't quite willing to change with them, especially if it came to uh, abetting and suborning the kind of debased world that we see in the way we live now instead of criticizing it. Uh, criticize it he did. And if those angers that he felt, if he felt those angers going into this book, they were certainly confirmed by the initial critical reactions because the initial critical reactions were savage. <laughs> Most critics, with a few rather obvious and obviously compromised exceptions, most critics hated the way we live now. And the, they hated it the more. The more of it they got, the more they hated. The more they learned of it, the more they hated. I think a lot of readers did too. A lot of readers hated it. And uh, the readers, I think, uh, can be excused. I think it's a, sort of the same divide that we see between professional reviewing in newspapers today and Goodreads or Amazon, where one is uh, a critic writing formally for the literary record and the other is people just reacting to the book. Both are valuable, invaluable, especially in, in, in looking back in history. And readers didn't like it either. And I believe, although a lot of them didn't um, articulate it this way, I believe that the main reason they didn't like it was because that warm blanket feeling, that Uncle Anthony Trollope feeling, was gone. And maybe they hadn't even identified that it was the main thing they liked about his books, but once it was gone, they were sure they wanted it back. That was a very different thing for the critics. The critics had been waiting for Trollope in the tall grass. They'd been waiting with knives for him for quite some time. He was unassailable. His sales were fantastic. He was mentioned in the same breath as Dickens. Uh, but they didn't like him. He was loud, and he was openly conservative, the novel who fox hunts, as Henry James put it. And uh, I believe there, that there was a, sort of an escrow account of animosity building up in his critics, and they let this book have it. Uh, Trollope defended it, he wrote an autobiography that was published posthumously that had, that did an enormous amount to damage his posthumous literary reputation. We can talk about that some other day. We'll probably read the autobiography. That would be a lot of fun. Read the maybe for uh, for nonfiction November. If we're doing Trollope standalones all year long, maybe for nonfiction November we'll read his autobiography. That's also in the public domain. It's free for you. And oh my God, the writers among you will find it so fascinating. And Trollope torpedoed himself with a lot of the stuff that he wrote in there. But in that autobiography. He rather uh, defiantly stood by the way we live now, said that it was, you know, not the least of his accomplishments. I think that's, there's a bit of irony involved in that, of course, because in academic circles, and I would say even in most uh, just Trollopian circles, circles of Trollop fans, this is now considered the contender for or the sure winner uh, to be the best book that he ever wrote. I don't know that I agree with that. It's, it, 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 there's a certain amount of irony there that, that uh, his own age didn't like it, but our age tends to, maybe because it's so insightful. <laughs> when, when Trollope is angry, having been genial for so long, you might expect his anger to misfire, but it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't at all. He knows his subjects backwards and forwards. He did when he loved them. So it's probably no surprise, it should come as no surprise, that he could be so good when he hates them. Uh, but <laughs> If that escrow account of, of hostility in the critics that I believe existed and was building up over time, you wait for somebody like this to make a misstep or what you perceive as a misstep so you can pounce on them. Uh, if uh, that escrow account of hostility existed, it certainly wasn't helped any by the very beginning of the book. Because at the very beginning of the book, we see something of what was probably one of Trollope's earliest conceptions of the whole novel. I don't think that at the very beginning of his planning of this book, he was thinking that Melmot would take over the book the way he does. Uh, I think he was mainly thinking of it as a satire of his own world, of the literary world, which is a really dangerous
dangerous thing to do because <laughs> you're putting the book out into that world. You're expecting the good graces of that world. Uh, Lady Carberry is talentless. False from head to toe, child calls her. She has absolutely no business writing a work of history, popular or otherwise. She doesn't know anything. Uh, but she's lovely and pliant and affectionate towards her friends, several of whom are literary editors in London. She very much wants to make a go of this literary career. And we, the book starts off with her sending letters to three of those editors, th the editors of the book sections at three different literary journals. And the first letter that she writes is to a close friend, Mr. Brune, and she writes him at great length about her book, and it's damning, absolutely damning. Because the more she writes to him in, a, in this jocular, conversational way about how she's, what she was doing in her book, the more we as readers realize that she's a moron. She doesn't know what she's doing. And uh, she's writing to him for a particular reason. I thought we would, we would read this because it's a lot of fun. She's writing to him for a particular reason. We see the pub sheets now on this channel. Uh, and those didn't quite exist in their form uh, in the 1870s as they do now. Uh, and it doesn't matter anyway because that is what Lady Carberry is trying to do. She's, she's trying to get him to look favorably upon her book. <laughs> and that's her, what her whole letter is about. Uh, I trust you will go with me in my view of the Queen of Scots. Guilty, guilty always. Adultery, murder, treason, and all the rest. But recommended to mercy because she was royal. A queen bred, born, and married, and with such other queens around her, how could she have escaped to be guilty? Marie Antoinette I have not quite acquitted. It would be uninteresting, perhaps untrue. I have accused her lovingly and have kissed when I scourged. That's all about all this. this is just bodice. What Trollope meant here is to send up the, the bodice-ripping uh, ridiculousness of a lot of, of popular so-called history at the time. One particular book, but also many others of its kind. These things are still written. This kind of stuff is still written. No one would write about it this way. But what what are the Bill O'Reilly books? Except this. Except this, this kind of the merest trace of history strained through a bottle of sentimentality. That's exactly, and we see a lot, there are lots of other examples of that. We don't see them often on this channel because I have nothing to do with them, but nevertheless. Uh, he sends uh, Mr. Brune this letter, and he gets it, he knows exactly what she's doing. Uh, and he tells himself uh, what he will do uh, in his paper. Uh, what? Let's see here. Uh, I marked it, and now I can't find it. He, we get a little example of uh, uh, of what he, the kind of thing that he will say about her book. He gets her letter, and he knows what she wants him to do. She wants him to praise it in his paper. Uh, Well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to find it, but we can move on. Uh, we can move on to the next editor. Uh, the next editor that she sends one to is uh, Mr. Booker at the Literary Chronicle. And uh, I, I don't need to, uh, to find the Mr. Brune because Mr. Mr. Booker knows exactly the same thing. He immediately recognizes what she's trying to do. And he knows what he will do in return because he himself has a book coming out and she has offered to review it for another literary journal. It couldn't be any plainer. She's offering to praise his book if, she pra if he praises or commissions praise of her own. And he knows what he will do. <laughs> he, uh, he knows what he will do. Uh, he was as adept at this sort of work and, and knew well how to review such a book as Lady Carberry's Criminal Queens without bestowing much trouble on the reading. He could almost do it without cutting the book so that its value for purposes after sale might not be injured. Uh, that means... I'm sure some of you know this already, but in case some of you don't, uh, Once Upon a Time, in addition to Deckled Edges, which a lot of you hate, books also had uncut pages. So every fourth, tenth, twentieth page, the, the, the thing was, was woven out of a gigantic picnic cloth <laughs> of, of canvas and that was folded and folded and folded and folded again to make the book. And that left folds on the outside. There were plenty of folds on the inside, on the spine, but it left some folds on the outside. So a brand new book would have uncut pages. We've seen them actually on this channel. Sometimes at the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston, I will get a book that still has uncut pages. No books are made like that anymore. But once upon a time, there was a whole range of equipment at a bookstore for the discriminating reader to cut pages. 
It was a specific kind of thing, like a CD opener. If any of you remember those, once upon a time, there was a CD opener. Or there's, in, in uh, the YouTube world, for the tech channels, there's a specific kind of box opener for when you're doing your unboxings and your, and your, uh, your initial impression videos. Uh, once upon a time, there was that sort of thing. Plenty of people just used, you know, a household knife or something like that. And plenty of people didn't do it. Plenty of people just didn't cut the pages of their books because, as this passage makes clear, if the pages are cut, you'll get less if you try to resell the books, not new anymore. Uh, it'd be like today, it'd be like trying to sell a new book without the dust jacket. And, uh, and, and the, uh, the editor here is saying that he doesn't even need to cut the pages, meaning that he can just take do with whatever random pages he can read, as opposed to reading the whole thing. Uh, uh, and yet Mr. Brooker was an honest man and had set his face persistently against many literary malpractices, stretched out type, insufficient lines, and the French habit of meandering with a few words over an entire page had been rebuked by him with conscientious strength. He was supposed to be uh, rather an Aristides among reviewers, that is a strict purist, uh, but circumstance as he was, needing, in other words, needing his own book reviewed, uh, he could not oppose himself altogether to the usages of the time. Bad, of course it is bad, he said to a young friend who was working with him on his periodical. Who doubts that? How many very bad things there are that we do. But if we were to attempt to reform all the bad ways at once, we should never do any good thing. I am not strong enough to put the world straight, and I doubt if you are. <laughs> uh, and then there is the third editor that she sends her le these, these begging letters to. And that is Mr. Alf. And Mr. Alf knows as well uh, what, what she wants. And... Uh, uh, he says himself, uh, wh where is it here? Uh, he, uh, likewise knows what she wants, but he decides to take a different approach. <laughs> and I, I want to read you that as well. This is from later on in our, in our 20 chapters. I'm sorry this is going on a bit long, but this is fantastic stuff. <laughs> this is, especially in my line of work, which is exactly this. Uh, this is from chapter 11. Uh, during the last six, week, lady, six weeks, Lady Carberry had lived a life of very mixed depression and elevation. Her great work had come out, The Criminal Queens, and had been very widely reviewed. In this matter, it had been by no means all pleasure, inasmuch as many very hard words had been said of her. In spite of the dear friendship between herself and Mr. Alf, one of Mr. Alf's most sharp-nailed subordinates had been set upon her work and had pulled it to pieces with, with almost rabid malignity. One would have thought that such a slight thing could hardly have been worthy of so protracted attention. Error after error was laid bare with merciless prolixity. No doubt the writer of the article must have had all the history at his finger ends, as in pointing out various mistakes made, he always spoke of the historical facts which had been misquoted, misdated, or misrepresented as being familiar in all their bearings to every schoolboy of 12 years old. The writer of the criticism never suggested the idea that he himself, having been fully provided with books of reference and having learned the art of finding in them what he wanted at a moment's notice, had, as he went to work, checked off the blunders without any more permanent knowledge of his own than a housekeeper has of coals when she counts so many sacks in the coal cellar. He spoke of the parentage of one wicked ancient lady and of the dates of frailties of another, with an assurance intended to show that, that an exact knowledge of all these details abided with him always. He must have been a man of vast and varied erudition, and his name was Jones. <laughs> the world knew him not, but his erudition was always there at the command of Mr. Alf and his cruelty. The greatness of Mr. Alf consisted in this, that he always had a Mr. Jones or two ready to do his work for him. It was a great business, uh, this of Mr. Alf's, for he had his Jones also for philology, for science, for poetry, for politics, as well as for history, and one special Jones, extraordinarily accurate and very well posted up in his references, entirely devoted to Elizabethan drama. <laughs> and Trollope goes on. I'm, I'm going to indulge this just a bit here. There is a review intended to sell a book, which comes out immediately after the appearance of the book, or sometimes before it. The review which gives reputation, but does not affect the sale, and which comes a little later, and the review which snuffs a book out quietly. The review which is to raise which is to raise or lower the author a single peg or two pegs, as the case may be, the review which is suddenly to make an author, and the review which is to crush him. An exuberant Jones has, has been known before now to declare aloud that he would crush a man, and a self-confident Jones has been known to declare that he had accomplished the deed. Of all reviews, the crushing review is the most popular, as being the most readable. When the rumor goes abroad that some notable man has been actually crushed, 
been positively driven over by an entire juggernaut's car of criticism till his literary body be a mere amorphous mass, then a real success has been achieved, and the Alf of the day has done a great thing. But even the crushing of a poor Lady Carberry, if it be absolute, is effective. <laughs> Such a review will not make all the, all the world call for the evening pulpit, but it will cause those who do take the paper to be satisfied with their bargain. Whenever the circulation of such a paper begins to slacken, the proprietors should, as a matter of course, admonish their ALF to add a little power to the crushing department. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Mr. Booker, the, the second editor, I, uh, tells himself that since he has, he cannot afford to do what Mr. Alf has done. He cannot crush Criminal Queens because he wants a favor from its author. He wants his own book praised. So instead he comes up with, we get a, an echo here of, of uh, Mr. Brune. Mr. Brooker himself wrote the article on the Criminal Queens in the Literary Chronicle, knowing that what he wrote would be also rubbish. Remarkable vivacity, power of delineating character, Excellent choice of subject. Considerable intimacy with the historical details of various periods. The literary world will be sure to hear of Lady Carberry again. <laughs> the composition of the review, together with the reading of the book, consumed altogether perhaps an hour of Mr. Booker's time. <laughs> he made no attempt to cut the pages, and here and there read those that were open. He had done this kind of thing so often that he knew well what he was about. He could have reviewed such a book when he was three parts asleep. When the work was done, he threw down his pen and uttered a deep sigh. He felt it to be hard upon him that he should be so compelled by the exigencies of his position to descend so low in literature, but it did not occur to him to reflect that in fact he was not compelled, and that he was quite at liberty to break stones or starve honestly, if no other honest mode of carrying his career was open to him. If I didn't, somebody else would, he said to himself. <laughs> this, is, this is savage stuff, and the, you can expect a hostile reception from book critics. If you write that kind of thing about book critics, <laughs> that's what Trollope got. And it started right away, and it continued. Uh, so uh, we're going to wrap, I'm going to wrap, the, I've gone on too long here because I love reading those parts about my own profession. Drag through the mud. <laughs> or not. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's where we end now with, uh, with Lady Pomona. We end with Lady Pomona's dinner party. Uh, and we're going to move on next Sunday uh, let's see. I, you can all you can all count as well as I can. I should, but we'll uh, we'll lay it out here so that we're all on the same page, quite literally. So we are going to read twenty more chapters. So uh, next time, uh, uh, we will go to unanimity is the very soul of these things, or I do love him, or all prepared somewhere around there, somewhere in those chapters where we'll fetch up next time. But for this time, uh, these first twenty chapters are. are uh, Brilliant, in my opinion. I'm, I'm amazed I haven't said that so far. They're, they're, they're uh, brilliant and scathingly funny. They're brutal, bare knuckle. I have been loving rereading them. I've read this I don't know how many times. I'm happy to read it another time. But I, as usual, at this point in our read-alongs, I always want to know what you're making, especially those of you who are encountering this book for the first time. Uh, I would love to hear what your impressions are. By, by chapter 20 of a normal Trollope novel, you would know who to, so to speak, root for that's a much tougher decision in this book. Everybody is, is hollow and fake. Are you rooting for anybody? Anybody at all? Are some of you maybe even perversely rooting for Melmot? I've known readers who did that. I've had students who did that who thought, well, you know, if I have to root for somebody in this mess, I might as well root for them. The biggest problem of all. One way or another, I want to hear it. I want to hear what your reactions are to, to encountering this book, especially for the first time. And we will move on. We will do uh, 20 more chapters for next Sunday as we continue uh, our philanthropic endeavor of, co of consorting with lonely trollops. <laughs> so we will reconvene next Sunday, and I'll see you then. Thank you, Book Two.